Four years after 9-11, almost to the day, we are still at war. Every day, American soldiers are dying in Iraq and in Afghanistan, in suicide bombings and ambushes. The death toll exceeds 1,800 in Iraq, with many thousands injured. While generals complain of a shortage of troops in Iraq, the military is falling short of recruitment goals. And in what seems like endless missions, thousands of our troops are stationed, not just in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also in Kosovo, Bosnia, in a variety of bases in Europe, Central Asia, Philippines, the Pacific, and in South Korea. While our military is stretched thin, the danger is far from over. The future of both Iraq and Afghanistan remains at best uncertain. Bin Laden and many of his deputies remain at large. After the gruesome bombing on, London, on the London Underground this summer, it is clear that the enemy continues to plot new attacks. Just this weekend, a new video, apparently from Al-Qaeda, threatens attacks on Los Angeles and Melbourne, Australia. And as the Department of Homeland Security implies in its advertisements on terrorism preparedness, it is just a matter of time before one plot or another will succeed and more Americans will be slaughtered. I've now mentioned the financial cost of our extensive military operations. The missions in Afghanistan and Iraq, military spending and reconstruction efforts are costing hundreds of billions of dollars. While deeply enmeshed in these campaigns, America faces other looming threats. Iran is building nuclear weapons. Unlike the Soviets, the Iranian mullahs do not fear death, making their use of such weapons more likely. Meanwhile, North Korea is again saber-rattling, boasting about its nuclear weapon technology. Imagine the North Koreans' arrogance when they can prove they actually have nuclear bombs. Within 10 years, terrorists might have a range of sources from which to buy an atomic bomb to use against us. Russia, possessing the second largest nuclear arsenal in the world, seems to be sliding towards fascism. China, fast becoming a rival if not a threat to us, is massively boosting its military spending. Today, more than ever, the importance of foreign policy is acute. Amid two unfinished wars in the Middle East and new threats elsewhere, seemingly confident voices can be heard in the realm of foreign policy. They have given many people hope and fired up their patriotism. What these voices have said comes as a refreshing contrast to the anti-American clamor we heard in the run-up to the Afghan and Iraq wars and continue to hear from many quarters almost every day. Proud of our nation's greatness, these intellectuals strike a bold pro-American chord, which has resonated powerfully with the public. These intellectuals are the neoconservatives. Armed with a clear, articulate foreign policy, the neocons stepped into an intellectual void exposed after 9-11. The purely pragmatic Republican and Democratic realists, as they're called, who had been appeasing terrorists and the regimes that support them for decades, had no answers for September 11th. Nor did other conservatives, such as Pat Buchanan-type isolationists, who hopelessly call for pulling up the drawbridge to fortress America. Nor, of course, did the pacifist left. Filling this intellectual vacuum, neocons gained influence in the White House. They were well positioned, having come to dominate the intellectual life of the Republican Party. Now, not all the administration's policies adhere to the neocon vision, and many of the important decision makers are not purely neocons. Uh, Rumsfeld and Powell, for example, are not. But much of 9-11 foreign policy has followed their recommendations, in particular the invasion and aftermath of Iraq. Charles Krauthammer a neoconservative columnist, has triumphantly defined the Bush administration's foreign policy as, quote, neoconservatism in power, unquote. 
Krauthammer observed that, quote, what neoconservatives have long been advocating is now being articulated and practiced at the highest level, levels of government by a war cabinet composed of individuals who, coming from a very different place, have joined the neoconservative camp and are carrying the neoconservative idea throughout the world, unquote. So who are the neoconservatives? Now, when the term neoconservative was coined by one of their critics in the 1970s, what united these intellectuals was that they all had started out as radical leftists, even communists, who had undergone a conversion. Initially, they became liberal anti-communists and through the 60s actively opposed the new left. Their experiences with the new and old left, with welfare programs and with Vietnam, had made them move closer to conservatism and became increasingly critical of American liberals. Irvin Kristol, considered the godfather of neoconservatism, described the group as, quote, liberals mugged by reality. They detested the explicitly anti-American, anti-capitalist, nihilistic views of the new left. Supposedly learning from the failures of communism and socialism, they claim to have a deep appreciation for the benefits of capitalism and the virtues inherent in, the American, in America's political system. If in 1972, most neocons, neocons reluctantly voted for McGovern, by 1980, all voted for Reagan. Since 1980, they have become a leading voice within the Republican Party. Today, neoconservatives are loosely connected through their affiliation with several think tanks, notably the American Enterprise Institute and magazines, such as the Weekly Standard, Commentary, the National Interest, and the Public Interest. Neoconservatives can be divided into two broad groups. Those who underwent a transition from left to right in the 60s and 70s, and another group who adopted neocon views from the beginning. The converts include Irving Kristol, Norman Podhoritz, Jean Kirkpatrick, and Daniel Patrick Moynihan. The second group, some of whom are children of the older generation, include William Kristol, Robert Kagan, Max Boot, Robert Bork, Leon Cass. Now, later on, I'll name and quote from several other neoconservatives. Now, there is disagreement regarding who is or isn't a neocon. I've used sources that are clearly identified by all as neoconservatives. There is also disagreement among neocons about specific topics, specific policies. I will consider the more principled representatives and the ideas that I think they all share. Now, what makes their foreign policy so appealing to so many people? Partially, it is that they have the president's ear and have been very influential. Broadly, their appeal rests on their seemingly unabashed pro-American stance. They regard America's political system as the best. They champion the defense of liberty. They favor ousting hostile regimes. They favor boosting military spending and building a missile defense system. Moreover, they are adamant about the role of morality in foreign policy and claim to be doing the right thing. Their morally toned pronouncements make them sound principled. You've heard echoes of this in, quote, we're with us, you're either with us or with the terrorists, or axis of evil, or end states who sponsor terrorism. This is in sharp contrast with the entrenched false alternative that pervades a lot of thinking on foreign policy. You can be for morality or practicality. The advocates of so-called morality are typically the liberals who reject America's national interests as irrelevant to policymaking. They are moved by grand notions of global unity and other nebulous ideas. That is what President Carter advocated and Clinton gave lip service to. On the other hand, is the amoral, allegedly practical policy of conservatives like Kissinger and Nixon, 
who will cut a deal with and accept the word of evil regimes if it's expedient to do so. Neoconservatives, however, claim that foreign policy should be guided by principle, not by short-term expediency, that there is no conflict between morality and practicality. That is, they claim that we should pursue our national interest, and that is moral. Now, here's a group of amazingly prolific intellectuals and scholars who have gained a real following in Washington with a distinctive and seemingly patriotic foreign policy. Their arguments sound as pro-American as you can find in the last 50 years. On an emotional level, they project what to many is an attractive image of, self, of a self-confident cowboy rooting out evildoers. They portray themselves and are seen to be standing up for America in a world so eager to blame and vilify it. And to many people, they really sound good. Now my purpose in this talk is to evaluate their foreign policy as implemented since 9-11 and answer the question, can their foreign policy actually defend America's interests? As for my frame of reference, I'll make my views known as we go, as we go along. I'll say now that I regard foreign policy as a derivative of political philosophy, uh, which itself is an application of ethics to a social context. The philosophy that informs my ethics and politics is objectivism, which holds reason as man's source of values and his own happiness, man's own happiness, as his highest purpose. In foreign policy, I hold that it is the government's proper function to protect the rights of its citizens from threats, both domestic and foreign. The point is to ensure that each American is free to pursue his own values. I advocate that America pursue its national interests, that is, that the government do whatever is necessary to defend the rights of its citizens in the face of attack. Now, the neocons also claim to be dedicated to pursuing our national interest in foreign policy. But this term's meaning is informed by one's moral political principles. So what do neocons mean by America's national interest? Read the books and essays of neoconservatives, and you'll find them rejoicing in America's ascent to the role of the world's only superpower after the Cold War a fact bemoaned by the left and acknowledged somewhat guiltily by mainstream conservatives. This unique position, they believe, enables the U.S. to assert its strength in the service of its national interests. And neocons believe that America should assert itself, by force if necessary, to rid the world of hostile regimes. For example, after September 11th, neocons urged a forceful military response. According to neocons, besides eliminating foreign threats, two foreign policy imperatives are crucial to America's national interests. Deterrence and spreading democracy. But are they? Assuming they are implemented as the neocons suggest, will they serve U.S. interests, deterrence and spreading democracy? That is, will they serve our self-defense? Now consider the idea of deterrence. In a certain context, it is obviously good for a country to forestall conflict and discourage would-be aggressors by a massive show of force. This can work to make a country more secure. But how would it be implemented? Deterrence requires that one strike at the enemy with overwhelming force and with a moral confidence that suggests that you will do it again. For example, in World War II, we deterred the Japanese from continuing to fight by dropping nuclear bombs on two of their cities. These bombs decisively ended the war, saving the lives of untold Americans. Take another example. Since 1979, Iran has funded and incited terrorist attacks against Americans, and for years has stopped the CIA's list 
of the most active terrorist sponsoring states. Had we crushed the Iranian theocracy in the 1990s, we probably would have deterred Iraq and the Taliban, which are materially and ideologically weaker enemies than Iran is. That is how I think deterrence can work. Now, how did the neocons construe deterrence? Well, one conflict in particular stands out because it did so much to galvanize the neocons. That was the war, if you remember, in Kosovo in the 1990s. U.S. military intervention in Kosovo, they held, was justified because it served the purpose of deterrence. And most, most important, if done right, <clears throat> it would bring freedom, that is, liberal democracy, to the Balkans. At the time, the non-pacifist left predictably advocated U.S. involvement in this humanitarian disaster. Most conservatives disputed that any U.S. interests were at stake and urged President Clinton to stay out of the conflict. But the neocons rejected the conservative position as isolationist, representing a very narrow and short-term view of Americans' interests. Now, why did the neocons believe that such intervention would advance our national interests? Well, as you may recall, the conflict in the former Yugoslavia during the 1990s was a bloody ethnic war. Neocons believed that the warlord Slodovan Milosevic must be stopped. Their argument was, if the United States had acted decisively and with significant ground troops and bombing against Milosevic, if the U.S. had proved its willingness to depose Milosevic, there would have been two benefits. One, the lives of hundreds of thousands of Serbians and Kosovars would have been saved. Two, other dictators around the world, like Saddam Hussein, would hesitate to threaten the U.S. or their citizens. So this was deterrence. Now, was Milosevic a direct or immediate threat to U.S. lives, property, or national security? No. And that doesn't matter. The neocons would retort. Removing the tyrant from power and resolving the ethnic conflict in the Balkans would serve America's national interest by its deterrence effect on other tyrants who are or might become serious threats to the United States. In the short term, by spilling some U.S. blood in the Balkans, we could ensure a more peaceful world for America tomorrow. So we gain by it, after all, they claim. Now, why the neocons were so eager to intervene in Kosovo will become evident in a little while. But Kosovo didn't go the way the neocons had wanted because Clinton was in office. But throughout the 1990s, they argued for military operations, again in the name of deterrence, in another country, Iraq. Here, they had a tall hold on plausibility, because Saddam Hussein was suspected of developing weapons of mass destruction and was clearly hostile to the United States. He was also, they emphasized, a vicious dictator whose treatment of Kurds and others was horrifying. Ousting Saddam Hussein, the neocons argued, would deter Iran, Syria, and international terrorism. Now, after 9-11, neocons renewed their advocacy for a military strike against Iraq, and the White House adhered to a neoconservative battle plan. Now, has this war deterred our enemies? Observe Iran and Syria's utter contempt for American power with the most powerful military force in the history of man at their doorsteps. Iran and Syria are undeterred. Iran continues to chase nuclear weapons technology and plays diplomatic games with the West, while both Iran and Syria aid militants in Iraq in killing U.S. troops. Iraq today is the worldwide epicenter of terrorism, rife with bomb factories and serving as a training ground for new recruits. However dangerous a threat Saddam Hussein's regime was, it pales in comparison to the mess that Iraq has become and where our soldiers are perishing daily. Neither Kosovo nor Iraq has deterred any of our enemies. Why? Deterrence requires targeting real threats and crushing them with massive force. 
Kosovo was a, Kosovo was a failure, not because Clinton was too soft, but, it, but because it was not even a plausible threat. Now, Iraq was a plausible threat, if only a minor threat relative to Iraq. But being a minor threat, ideologically and materially, it could not serve as a deterrent for a much stronger country like Iran. Picking a weak adversary to beat up on does not deter the bully. Instead, it emboldens him because he concludes that you're not strong enough or morally courageous enough to go after him. Moreover, rather than mounting a shock and awe campaign in Iraq, from the outset, our forces were constrained by Washington whose real purpose was evidently to establish a democracy in Iraq. Hence the delicate bombing to spare the country's infrastructure. Hence the spectacle of our troops being made to tiptoe around holy shrines and risking their lives to rebuild sewer systems, open schools, and guard voting booths, all to curry favor with the Iraqis. Now this brings us to the neoconservatives' advocacy of spreading democracy, a policy they claim that benefits the U.S. in the long run. Does it? Neoconservatives note that the surface of the globe is crawling with dictatorships of various stripes, totalitarian governments and autocratic monarchies, regimes, which are potentially or actual threats to America. Our national interest requires not only that we topple dictatorships, we ought, to find, we ought to finish the job by erecting solid liberal democracies in their place. Now by this term, they mean a system with democratic voting, some minimal protection of rights, and an economy with some freedom and some government controls. Pointing to centuries of political history, neocons observe that democracies don't start wars. They tend not to ally themselves with regimes hostile to America. And they seldom, if ever, commit atrocities, summary executions, genocide, for which dictatorships are notorious. The more liberal democracies in the world, the safer America will be in the long run. That is the argument. Now leave aside the question of the value of democracy as majority rule. But let's assume that the neocons want some kind of real constitutional government that to some degree really does protect rights. Is it proper for America to wage wars to spread liberal democracy? Now my answer to that is never. Freedom in other countries is a value to America in a certain context. It is appropriate for the US to advocate for freedom, to provide moral support to genuine freedom fighters, to help already free countries like Taiwan and Israel arm and protect themselves against our common enemies. This is essentially an intellectual enterprise of applying America's moral sanction. It is a derivative of the fundamental purpose of government, protecting its citizens' individual rights. In foreign policy, that task first and foremost requires eliminating any objective threats to our security. The only goal of war must be victory, the total defeat of the enemy, the elimination of the threat. Defeating Japan and Germany in World War II was properly the focus of that war. Now once an enemy is defeated, its political future can be considered. Note that in post-war Japan, not one American soldier died from a Japanese insurrection. If such an insurrection had arisen, I have no doubt that General MacArthur, who administered occupied Japan, would have crushed it ruthlessly and only then engaged in political reform. Of course, making fundamental changes quickly to a country's culture and political system is probably only possible after that culture's complete and thorough defeat and humiliation. What the neoconservatives advocate, however, is something else entirely. They are for spreading democracy as the primary, in fact, as a substitute 
for destroying hostile forces. This is manifest in, Bush, in the Bush administration's handling of the war in Iraq. The proper goal of subduing hostiles was subordinated to the humanitarian goal of rebuilding the society's infrastructure. Witness the frenzy a year ago to hand over authority to an interim Iraqi leadership. Witness the headlong rush in January to hold representative elections. Observe that we hear, on, we hear only about liberating Iraq, not about crushing our enemies. Neoconservatives insist that a democratic Iraq will serve as, as an exemplar, and so freedom will somehow sweep across the Middle East. Now, this is sheer fantasy. Politics, as Ayn Rand observed decades ago, is not a starting point, but an end product of one's deeper moral philosophical premises. To achieve the value of freedom and economic success, one must have a specific type of political system, one that respects individual rights which can only come into existence and survive if it is based on individualism, which in turn can ultimately only survive if based on the right ethics and on a rational view of man's fundamental nature. It is precisely this kind of intellectual foundation that the Iraqis lack. While we hear ad nauseum about the rights of various Iraqi minorities, Kurds, Shiites, and tribal groups, have you heard a peep about the rights of the smallest minority, the individual? A glance at the draft Iraqi constitution is enough to see that it is, ma it is a mass of contradictions that makes a mockery of individual rights while laying the groundwork for a collectivistic, perhaps theocratic state. Now that should come as no surprise. Iraqis, like so many people in the Middle East, hold philosophical values that in fact contradict the base of political freedom. For them, the individual is defined by and owes his loyalty to his membership in some group. Observe who ran for elections. There was a spectrum ranging from advocates of secular collectivistic ideologies, communists and Baathists, to those defined by bloodlines, such as Kurds and Turkmen, to members of various religious sects, like Shiites and Sunnis. Government for them is not a means of protecting rights, but a tool for dominating over the lives of others. Observe the unconcealed and appalling power grab among the tribal leaders as they drafted a new constitution for Iraq. This portends a resumption of tribal and sectarian strife as the group in power seeks to extract its revenge for some long ago blood feud. Now you might ask, isn't it enough for a country to have decent political institutions, even if it lacks the proper philosophical framework? The answer is no. Contrary to what the neoconservatives might argue, even the best political institutions, including a formal good constitution, cannot on their own safeguard freedom. You can see this in the history of the United States, the first nation deliberately founded on the principle of individual rights. To protect rights, the founding fathers wrote a magnificent constitution and created a brilliantly integrated system of checks and balances to curb the power of the state. And yet today, Americans increasingly act, live, and own property, not by right, but only by permission of government bureaucrats. Just try applying for a business license, or consider the ever-growing maze of regulations that businesses contend with, or consider the recent decision by the Supreme Court in the Kello case that totally eviscerates property rights. The gradual erosion of rights happened because this nation lacks the proper moral philosophy to sustain its political system. Without that moral philosophical underpinning, America saw the rise of statism, the view that indi the individual belongs to and must serve the state, not his own interests. It is philosophy 
that ultimately shapes the course of history. Not economics and not politics. Now, of course, Iraqis, like all human beings, do have free will. And they can change their views. True, there has been an intellectual revolution sweeping the Middle East. But it did not begin with the Iraq War. Nor has it been sparked by U.S. efforts to spread democracy. It began half a century ago. And I am referring to the fiery upsurge of radical Islam. Its first major victory was the establishment of Islamic theocracy in Iran. This ideology seeks to impose Islamic rule throughout the world, to varying degrees in Nigeria, Sudan, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and elsewhere. Radical Islamists have successfully imposed Sharia, Islamic religious law, as the foundation of law and government. In Iraq, not only is Islam recognized by the draft constitution as the official religion of the state, and the basic source of law, Islamists have already taken over big chunks of the south, including the city of Basra, turning it into a theocracy akin to Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, all under the noses of the British and Americans. Yet neoconservatives vow to bring democracy to a world ignorant of individual rights, of reason, of what capitalism is and should be. This improbable effort, depending on the specific case, might deliver temporary respite and maybe a little freedom. But it cannot last. In a place like Iraq, mystical and tribal to the core, with no history of respect for reason or the individual, freedom, even in the short run, is impossible. People can vote as they did in Iran this summer. Voting does not make for a free country. As Ayn Rand noted regarding Vietnam, quote, the right to vote is a consequence, not a primary cause of a free social system. And its value depends on the constitutional structure implementing and strictly delimiting the voter's power. Unlimited majority rule is an instance of the principle of tyranny. Outside the context of a free society, who would want to die for the right to vote? Yet that is what the American soldiers were asked to die for. Not even their own vote, but to secure that privilege for the South Vietnamese, who had no other rights and no knowledge of rights or freedom." Unquote. Now just to replace South Vietnam with Iraq, there is no difference. The blood of American soldiers did not fertilize the growth of freedom in Vietnam, nor can it do so in the intellectually barren soil of the Middle East. Should Iraq and other supposed democracies fall into the hands of our real enemies in the Middle East, totalitarian Islam, it would be a disaster. This could happen without elections, but imagine the tragedy of American troops dying so Iraqis can vote in Islamists. If this happens democratically, such regimes will gain legitimacy in the eyes of the world. President Bush has confessed as much. If Iraqis or Lebanese or Palestinians elect radical Islamists, he will respect their vote because he said, quote, democracy is democracy, unquote. To sum up, Neoconservatives advocate using a military military force in the name of deterrence and to spread freedom for the sake of our national interest. But this policy does not in fact serve our national interest. It has cost us the irreplaceable lives of thousands of American soldiers and left real threats, principally Iran, undeterred. Now it is not an accident that the neoconservatives foreign policy fails to achieve security for the United States. That it is impractical, cannot be blamed on the Bush administration's application of the policy. I would argue, as Krauthammer does, that the administration has been applying, neo, uh, applying neoconservative policies consistently. No, it is impractical because it is based 
on an impractical philosophy, which despite advocating for the national interest, is thoroughly self-sacrificial. Now, we call the neoconservatives' advocacy of military intervention in Kosovo. The primary reason for risking the lives of American troops in the former Yugoslavia was that one ethnic tribe was attempting to cleanse the land of another group. That is, human beings were suffering and dying in vast numbers. It was a humanitarian disaster. This imperative surfaces repeatedly as a theme running through neoconservative writings. For example, many neocons supported our intervention in Somalia and objected when we left. Some of them regret that the U.S. did not send troops to prevent the horrific massacres in Rwanda. And today they are calling for U.S. intervention in Sudan or in any place in the world where there happens to be a massacre. As Robert Kagan and Vance Sirchuk explained, quote, Unfortunately, Sudan's barbarity almost certainly will continue in the absence of effective action in U.S. leadership. The failure of world nations to force Sudan to change its behavior is merely the latest reminder of a fact we should have learned since the end of the Cold War in the Balkans, in Rwanda, and in Iraq. They continue, quote, For months it has been obvious that stopping Sudan's campaign in Darfur will require putting several thousand foreign troops on the ground. It has been obvious that some of these troops will have to be Americans, unquote. Such interventions are, of course, pitched as advancing U.S. interests. Observing this connection, how Iraq and Afghanistan were initially sold as self-defense wars, with some plausibility. But the alleged goal of serving U.S. interests and implying deterrence to neighboring hostiles was indeed a fig leaf. And having served its purpose, the fig leaf has been discarded. The neocons, along with the Bush administration, celebrate the humanitarian, humanitarian angle of rebuilding these nations. In their book, An End to Evil, David Frum and Richard Pearl extol the American people's response to September 11th. Quote, they have fought two campaigns on the opposite sides of the globe, saving millions of Afghans from famine and the nation of Iraq from tyranny. Unquote. It is not surprising that both wars have become long-term commitments to the new regimes, with Americans as peacekeepers and food suppliers. We went to war not to protect America, but to mount Operation Iraqi Freedom to liberate the Middle East. For neoconservatives, American humanitarian intervention is a moral obligation. In a book selling the Iraq war, before the war, Kaplan and Crystal write, quote, America cannot escape its responsibility for maintaining a decent world order. The answer to this challenge is the American idea itself, and behind it is the unparalleled military and economic strength of its custodian. Unquote. The United States has a duty to protect the poor, the suffering, the downtrodden. Why? Because of its strength, its virtue, its wealth. As Max Boot, former editor of the Wall Street Journal editorial page, writes, after all, quote, why not use some of the awesome power of the U.S. government to help the downtrodden of the world, just as it is used to help the needy at home, unquote. Now, this, in essence, is global welfare. Now, do you protest that this requires imperiling countless American lives, that no real U.S. interest is thus served? Again, to quote Max Boot, who offers a revealing answer, quote, It is a curious morality that puts greater value on the life of even a single American pilot, a professional who has volunteered for combat, than on hundreds, even thousands of Kosovo lives. Now, did you catch that monstrous statement? On this vicious premise, American lives, if they're soldiers, are disposable. It is immoral to value our lives more than the needs of the poor Kosovars. 
Now, the same premise underlies the neoconservatives' flippant observation that Iraq has so far cost us a trivial 1,800 U.S. lives. The implication being that the plight of Iraq justifies spilling rivers of American blood, that we should be willing to keep adding zeros to the end of this death toll. In morality, neoconservatives advocate the creed of self-sacrifice, altruism. Now, do not confuse altruism with, the, with generosity or compassion towards others. Altruism is the moral code that holds self-sacrifice as the highest moral duty. When I say sacrifice, I don't mean the rejection of the worthless, but of the precious. It does not mean helping your friends, but selling them out to your enemies. It means the surrender of a greater value for the sake of a lesser or non-value. Neoconservatives are for the wholesale sacrifice of our, wells, of our wealth and lives for the sake of Kosovo's, Iraqis, and anyone else deemed needy. It is not just with regard to Iraq or Kosovo, or Sudan, or Rwanda. It is not just an occasional aberration that they urge self-sacrifice. This is a moral principle underlying their foreign policy. As one neocon scholar has observed, quote, Americans had nothing to gain from entering Vietnam, not land, not money, not power. According to the neoconservatives, the American effort in Vietnam was a product of one of the noblest traits of the American character, altruism in the service of principles." Unquote. Sacrifice, however, cannot be sold to the American people at face value. They would find a blatant call to selfless service repundant. Instead, neoconservatives seek to smuggle in their altruism by making it seem beneficial to the victim, the American people. This is why they invoke the national interest, because it suggests that there is some practical benefit to us. Of course, we saw that as a fraud. It is merely a fig leaf to make respectable, selfless humanitarian interventions in Kosovo, Sudan, Liberia, and Iraq. Part of the fraud entails appearing to be reasonable. After all, an outright call for policing every dictatorship or bringing relief to every famine would rightly strike the American public as impractical and even suicidal. There is, after all, a long, long list of so-called rogue regimes. So the US, we hear, should be a reluctant sheriff, to quote them prioritizing targets according to how serious they are and the costs of military intervention. But altruism is just beneath the surface. What would arouse this reluctant sheriff? Quote, when the threatened townsfolk turn to it in desperation, unquote. In other words, the desperate need of others, regardless of whether their plight is deserved or not, their need is a moral claim on American lives. Now listen to Condoleezza Rice pitching the same idea, relying on the pretense that selfless service to others is actually somehow egoistic. Quote, as the president has said, we have a responsibility to build a world that is not only safer but better. The United States will fight poverty, disease, and oppression because it is the right thing to do, and the smart thing to do." Unquote. Fighting our enemies to make the world safer for Americans is egoistic. Fighting poverty, disease, and oppression of others is not. Yet she presents the right thing to do, selfless service to others, as the smart thing to do, the practical way of advancing America's interests. Now, this massive deception is what neocons count on when they argue that we should use American troops as global policemen, preventing mass killings, helping to topple dictators, 
encouraging, and if necessary, actively building democracies. Now, of course, presenting altruism with a veneer of self-interest is not a new gimmick. This is, in essence, the same gimmick altruists, particularly liberals, have long used to justify statist programs. For example, to prevent crime, everyone must be taxed to help the poor. Because if you don't, you might one day be a victim of a crime resulting from poverty. That's how it's pitched. A proper response to crime in a free society is to incarcerate and punish criminals, not to have the state do the criminal's job of stealing wealth from those who earned it and give it to those who did not. In foreign policy, the response to hostile nations is to make them non-threatening by whatever means necessary in order to protect American lives. Now, I would add that flushing millions of dollars down the welfare sewer is less heinous a moral crime than sacrificing our troops' lives in an attempt to install democracy across the globe. The argument regarding crime rests on the notion that society is a collective, some sort of superorganism apart from and superior to the sum of individual members. The same is true on a larger scale of the neoconservative argument for making the US a global policeman. Underlying it is the premise that every country in the world is somehow interconnected, that immorality anywhere will somehow be detrimental to the US sometime in the future. On this view, a short-term sacrifice will bring rewards in the future. But to whom? For what? We will see in a moment, but obviously not to individual Americans. Indeed, the neoconservatives seldom talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of each individual's happiness. The concept of individualism is seldom discussed in their voluminous literature. As befits their collectivism, when they do talk about individual freedom, they regard it as a threat to the community. Individuals are mindless beasts, and it is dangerous to give them too much liberty. Gertrude Hibbelfarb explains, quote, a liberty that is divorced from tradition and convention, from morality and religion, that makes the individual the sole repository and arbiter of all values, such a liberty is a grave peril to liberalism itself, unquote. Recall that many neoconservatives begun as socialists and Trotskyites and converted gradually to conservatism. In essentials, though, nothing has changed. Like the left, they hold that it is immoral to serve one's own interests, but moral to sacrifice for others. Like the left, they hold that one has duties to his community, but on a global scale, in their ethics, the neoconservatives are intellectual blood brothers of the left. Now, there is one important difference, however. The neoconservatives are not explicitly anti-American. On the contrary, as I have emphasized, they are staunch defenders of American greatness, and they portray themselves as patriots, which raises the question, what animates the seeming patriotism? Now, they not only claim to be patriotic, the neocons have a mission. Now, that is what makes them so dangerous. As Kaplan and Crystal write, quote, promoting democracy is a pragmatic goal in that it makes the world more congenial to America. But while it is a so sound strategy, it is also America's particular inheritance, unquote. Now, what exactly is this inheritance, and what does it mean in practice? Neocons take their inspiration from, among others, Theodore Roosevelt. At the turn of the 20th century, he called on America to find a higher purpose, to take on global responsibilities. Quote, a nation's first duty is within its borders, Roosevelt said. 
but it is not thereby absolved from facing its duties in the world as a whole. And if it refuses to do so, it merely forfeits its right to struggle for place among the people that shape the destiny of mankind." Unquote. But neocons, America's, quote, sense of responsibility to a world community beyond our own borders is a virtue, unquote. As William Bennett has written, quote, we will need a president who can summon Americans to meet their great destiny as a people, who can appeal to their unique sense of idealistic patriotism and inspire them to engage in present sacrifice when necessary to promote future security, unquote. War, a mission to bring freedom to the world, will inspire the American people, imbue them with national pride. Quoting William Bennett again, American global leadership based on American principles reinforces our commitment to common, ancient, honorable ideals and reminds us of who we are, unquote. By accepting, quote, our great des destiny as a people, unquote, according to neocons, by embracing our national inheritance, America would be lifted, quote, into a place of honor among the world's great powers. Now, this seeming love of country is intoxicating to many Americans who truly value this nation. Neocons da thus have the means to rally mass support for their vision. And this is what makes them so dangerous. Now, what facts of reality give rise to the concept of an American inheritance or an American destiny? The term has no rational meaning. A society is merely a collection of individuals. A nation can have no goals. Only individual citizens do. A destiny is an inevitable fate that is ordained, determined, imposed by forces outside one's control. Accepting a destiny means recognizing and obeying whatever force is supposedly in charge, not yourself. According to neocons, it is our duty to fulfill this American destiny. But what is duty? What facts of reality give rise to our alleged duty? None. A duty is an unchosen moral obligation. It means, quote, the moral necessity to perform certain actions for no reason other than obedience to some higher authority without regard to any personal goal, motive, desire, or interest, unquote. The source of this malignant concept is not reality, but some alleged power that wipes out rational judgment. As Ayn Rand observed, quote, duty destroys reason. It supersedes one judgment, one knowledge and judgment, making the process of thinking and judging irrelevant to one's actions, unquote. Of course, the neocons are not the only ones who call upon people to fulfill a moral duty. Communists used to invoke the duty of the productive to sacrifice and submit to the demands of the needy. Nazis invoked the duty to serve the German Volk or nation, the superior race. In religious ethics, man owes duties to a supernatural God. Whether the duty is to serve the poor, one's parents, the race, or mankind as a whole, or whether it is for the sake of God or another supernatural being, the source of duty is always mystical and non-rational. Now what to make of a duty to fulfill American destiny? The, this alleged American destiny is nationalist collectivist myth. Now we Americans are noble people, heirs to a great tradition. But what does that mean? It means, according to the neocons, that we have a responsibility to the world. Give your wealth, give of your wealth, of your life, for the sake of the nation's honor. Why? Because it is your duty to fulfill, to help fulfill our world historical destiny. Now this, in essence, is a fascist call for sacrifice in the name of the state, with a mystical ideal destiny as the motivator. It is a demand for nationalist submission, in fact, 
cloaked in appearance of upholding individual freedom. The goal of inspiring the populace with an unquestioning nationalist zeal flows directly from the neoconservatives' collectivism. The collectivist regards man as an incompetent, a helpless, mindless creature who must be fooled and ruled. He must be made to serve the alleged needs of the group. Now, you might be thinking that this rhetoric of destiny and duty must be limited to the fringes of, neoconservatism, of the neoconservative movement. Well, think again. Consider this recent pronouncement. We are confident, too, that history has an author who fills time and eternity with this purpose. We know that evil is real, but good will prevail against it. We did not ask for this mission, yet there, it, there is honor in history's call, unquote, from the same speaker. Quote, advancing these ideals is the mission that created our nation. It is the honorable achievement of our fathers. Now it is the urgent requirement of our nation's security and the calling of our time, unquote. Speaker, of course, is President George W. Bush, who is shameless about his religious faith. He replaces American destiny with a religious calling. Now, although religion does not come up explicitly in the neocons' discussion of foreign policy, their writings lean heavily on religion. It is central to their intellectual outlook. For them, religion is the means of ordering society, of inducing men to be moral, of creating a stable world. I'll let the godfather of neoconservatism, Irvin Kristol, explain this point. He writes, quote, it is crucial to the lives of all our citizens that they encounter a world that possesses transcendent meaning in which the human experience makes sense." Unquote. In other words, people need a transcendent destiny, a religious calling to give their life meaning. One of the philosophical inspirations for the neoconservatives, Reinhold Niebuhr, a theologian, writes, quote, religious ideas and traditions are the ultimate sources of the moral standards from which political principles are derived. In any case, both the foundation and the pinnacle of any cultural, any cultural structure are religion." Unquote. The neoconservatives may have discarded communism and socialism as impractical, but they did not renounce communism's moral premise. They claim to be pro-capitalists who cherish America, but not because it is the system, capitalism, the system of individualism and egoism. They want to harness America's unequal economic political power as a practical means to their altruistic ends, making the able, prosperous, productive sacrifice for the sake of the weak, poor, needy of the world. The justification for this is not Marx's historical determinism, but another alleged mystical force, religion. It is religion that imposes a duty on America to fulfill its nationalist destiny. When neocons talk of boosting the greatness of America, a purpose that resonates with many people, they mean enforcing America's destiny. That is, enforcing a supposed moral duty to self-sacrifice. Like communists who foisted their ideological yoke on country after country, Unlike religious zealots who impose the word of God on others, some neocons, now granted a minority, have called for the establishment of a U.S. empire. This empire would require stationing U.S. troops all over the world to safeguard peace and ensure American dominance. It would also increase our ability to encourage peacefully or by force regime change in democracy. Some neocons contend that we already are a de facto empire with upteen far-flung military outposts and call for the administration and the American people to embrace this. Now, how can an empire be accomplished when our military is already stretched thin? While they have not called for a military draft, they are not intellectually opposed to one. After all, they are not truly advocates of individual rights. If their plans are not met 
through voluntary enlistment, I have no doubt they will start advocating for draft. And why not? Even as it blatantly violates the rights of, of our young men, a draft would serve the nation's destiny. It would be patriotic. Neoconservatives are an insidious intellectual force. They endanger America's survival. If they win, America may still be here, but it will not be the America that a rational person values, the nation of whose ideals the founding fathers staked their lives in sacred honor. The short-term dangers are evident in the newspaper headlines. Iraq is a mess. Billions of dollars squandered, hundreds of our troops dead, thousands injured. And for what? So that the various tribes, ethnic groups, and sects can fight for the spoils? So that the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq can win an election? So that Iran can have more influence? So that terrorists can hone their skills in killing American troops? Iraq is a precedent for future campaigns to spread freedom on the self-defeating approach of herding peasants into voting booths. This needlessly risks American lives. Our overextended military may well become demoralized as these missions drag on and as further interventions become necessary to keep warring tribes from slaughtering each other with their democratically acquired power. As I noted, some neoconservatives have pushed for, government, for the government to send troops to Sudan. Other such, such missions will arise, and so will the cause for sending our forces to police the world in the name of fulfilling a unique destiny. All the while, real threats mount. We've completely neglected Iran and Saudi Arabia the two countries most responsible for the spread of totalitarian Islam, a real enemy. They, Iran, Saudi Arabia, terrorists, are emboldened by the shameful sight of American forces acting as international social workers. Turning to the long term, the dangers are enormous. Neoconservatives cash in on the remnants of America's self-confidence and patriotism. Americans, justly, rejected the nihilism of the radical left. Americans do not believe we are as evil as the terrorists, that our soldiers are monsters, that the war, that war is always wrong, and that we are an immoral country. Neoconservatives count on the appeal of a self-assertive foreign policy. They portray themselves, portray themselves as patriots. What they actually value, though, is not the America that defends at home and abroad the individual's right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness, but America as a collectivistic nation endowed by history or by God with a heroic mission, with a fig leaf of advancing America's national interests, neoconservative smuggle in a foreign policy that demands a sacrifice of wealth and lives for our alleged destiny. All of this paves the road for worse, more mystical and collectivistic political movements. Everything that the neocons push for also advances the goals of the more consistent mystics and collectivists. To the extent that the neocons sell themselves as pro-America, they must appear to be pro-self-interest and try to put a humane face on the cannibal morality of altruism. But this will make them seem inconsistent and mealy-mouthed by comparison with the more ardent and unabashed advocates of nationalistic collectivism. Those more aggressive mystics will feel emboldened to declare themselves outright advocates of altruism and self-sacrifice for the sake of American destiny or for the sake of the charismatic supreme leader. To the extent that the neocons foreign policy fails, to the extent that American sacrifices failed, fail to yield security, as they must fail, 
so the more consistent nationalists will come forward. The American people will rightly feel that a policy of self-interest, as the neoconservatives sold it, was indeed a failure because it was not bold enough. The solution? Well, perhaps a nationalist strongman who compels obedience and the surrender of freedom in America to achieve the global triumph of so-called liberty in the rest of the world. By such means, the road is paved. America's fall will not be brought about, America's fall will be brought about, not by those advocating hatred for America, but by those professing love for it, not by those denouncing capitalism, but by those professing admiration for it, not by those denying America's right to self-defense, but by those claiming to support it. But I do not want to end on a note of despair. America is not yet lost. There is still time. In my view, to help save America, we who value this country and our own lives, we who rightly oppose the corrupt morality of self-sacrifice, we must oppose the neoconservatives for the future of this country. Their foreign policy is not better than nothing. It is worse. It is immoral. And we must not give them our sanction. At every step, on every concrete, we must challenge them. Ayn Rand, the greatest opponent of communism ever, did not support America's wars in Korea and in Vietnam. She did not regard them as better than the alternative in combating communism. She identified those wars for what they were, immoral, and urged that the troops be returned home, and that America embrace the real principle of self-defense. In justice to our troops and to our own values, it is time we called for a stop of the sacrifice of American servicemen in Iraq. Let's fight this war properly, target our real enemies, Islamic totalitarianism, and recommit ourselves to the principle of self-defense, or else bring the troops home. Our soldiers are not expendable animals to be sacrificed on the altar of it's better than nothing. We must expose the neoconservatives and their disciples in Washington for the altruists and collectivists that they really are. We must present the American people with a consistent true philosophy. We must fight for reason and against religion, for egoism and against altruism, for individual rights and against collectivism, for capitalism and against fascism. Now such a philosophy exists, and you know its originator, Ayn Rand. If you desire to save America, you will find the necessary ammunition in her books. Arm yourselves with a philosophy grounded in reality and intended for life on this earth. The neoconservatives win by default and deception. We have reality on our side. Let us fight for what is true and refuse to support our destroyers. America does not have a destiny. Its future lies in the choices we in this room make in and our success in the battles we face. Thank you. We'll take uh, Dr. Gatte. Uh, we'll, Dr. Gatte and I will take questions now. Uh, if you will come to the mic in the middle, and uh, I emphasize questions. We got one. Richard, could I ask you to comment briefly on the effect of a lack of uh, a rational ideology as a foundation for public policy in some other countries? One one example might be. Uh, 
Tony Blair trying to build a basis for policy on the British Labor Party. Or uh, recently when uh, I saw the media coverage of the Gaza settlers being dragged out of their homes, um, at least the way the media covered it, uh, none of them were quoted as saying this is a, a vain attempt at appeasement to get Palestinians to love Israel, uh, or even that they were defending Western civilization and individualism and values. They were wearing phylacteries and, and making basically a, an argument of, of escaping from Queens to live in, in, uh, in the Zionist state. Do you have any comments on, on how, that, how similar problems play out in other countries? Yeah, I mean, it, it, they all play out pretty much the same. That is that um, in all the examples mentioned, and really in every country across the world, the, uh, the best, even the best people, the ones who sound the best, uh, like Tony Blair sometimes sounds about terrorism, um, are completely inconsistent and ultimately undercut the good stuff that they say and do once in a while. So I think the, the, the best example of Tony Blair was the response to the London bombings. What was the response to the London bombings? Well, in the immediate aftermath, I mean, I think the next day, uh, the G8 was meeting in Edinburgh, I think, in, in Scotland. Uh, and they immediately had a press conference. And what did they say? They said, okay, in order to fight terrorism, what we're going to do is we're going to give, was it $40 billion to Africa? And $9 billion to the freedom-loving, peaceful Palestinians. In other words, in order to stop terrorism in London, we are going to appease the poor and the violent of the world. We're going to help terrorists get funding so that in order to stop terrorism. That is altruism. We're going to take the hard-earned wealth of our citizens and dish it out to the Hamas, which is where it's going, um, in order to stop terrorism. Now, those are the kind of contradictions that are inevitable when you hold a false morality and a false political philosophy. And when you, there is no possibility of consistency in that case. Now, of course, in Israel, the same thing happens. Um, you're either in Israel a, an appeasing um, leftist who wants to give the Palestinian everything they want, including money to fund terrorism like Tony Blair, or you're a mystic fanatic who has no, you know, whose only reason for fighting is because the Old Testament tells you to do so. Uh, there is no rational approach to politics in Israel, and you can see it in the mishmash of policies that result from that. There is no coherent, positive uh, agenda that any Israeli politician, any Israeli politician has. And it's because of their flawed philosophical premises. They're all altruists. They're all collectivists. How do you, find how do you fight Palestinian collectivism with Israeli collectivism? Well, you can't. In spite of the fact that the Israelis are better, they respect individual rights more, they are peaceful, they are black, they are white as compared to the Palestinians black in terms of a contrast, that white is suicidal. It turns itself, I guess, into red by committing suicide because of a lack of a coherent, rational, consistent philosophy. And therefore, every free country without such a philosophy is destined, to his destiny, to deteriorate and ultimately to commit suicide, unless the, 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 the philosophy ch changes. I mean, <clears throat> if I can, uh, if I take what you're saying, you're saying that it's the same essential contradiction that the US held, but in diluted form, so that you have the American sense of life, which is pro-reason, pro-individualism, <clears throat> and pro this world, and they sense that there's something evil about these terrorists. And when you hear Tony Blair speak occasionally, he'll do it in a kind of moral outrage terms, that there's something really evil about these people. But they can't advocate the good. The moment he has to say, well, what are we going to replace it with? Well, we're going to replace it with altruism. We're going to replace it with aid to Africa, aid to Palestine, the Palestinians, etc. So it's the same. It's in diluted form because they're still Westerners. And to the extent that the British the Israelis are still Westerners, they have some inkling that there's something good about reason, there's something good about freedom, there's something good about individualism. But they have no intellectual or moral voice with which to defend that. And they can't have it absent objectivism, I think. 
and, and therefore they don't act based on it. So it, it's, it's a voice and then the actions contradict that, sen that remnant of a sense of life that they have. Dr. Brooke, you talked about the cost of this global um, democracy uh, in terms of dead US soldiers and uh, billions of dollars. But can you quantify that more to the individual American, what this is going to cost them in the next, say, 10 years in reality? Because I haven't read so What's it going like to cost for an individual American in the next 18 years? I cannot put a dollar sum, but it's, it's a huge dollar sum for every individual American. But <laughs> it's, it's much more than that. It's going to cost us our children. I mean, it's going to cost us freedom in this country. Uh, but, but it's going to cost us the lives of, of our children. Um, it, it, it's going to cost us huge amounts of money, and therefore it's going to cost us in our standard of living. But ultimately, it's going to cost us freedoms. I mean, look at the Patriot Act, which, which in many ways is, is a, um, restri places huge restrictions on our individual rights. Now, it would be okay in an emergency for a period of time where war is fought, and then it's repealed after the war. But this war has been set up in such a way that it's never going to be over. I mean, President Bush has said this war will never be won. Therefore, the Patriot Act, and I fear for much worse than the Patriot Act coming down the pike, um, because they're not willing to fight a war that is winnable. And therefore, we'll suffer Patriot Act-like violations of rights for the, you know, for the, for the indefinite future, for, you know, maybe forever. Hopefully not. But, but that is the downside. So it is going to affect each one of our lives in dollars, in the life of our friends, families, children, and in, in our rights, in our freedoms. Yeah, well, I agree with that. And I, I just don't see it in the media as being filtered down to everyday life for uh, American people. For instance, the falling, the value of the dollar falling, and the real cost of this ongoing war. Um, no, we're just, we're just really not getting it quantified. Well, sure, but, but how could the media do it? I mean, A, they agree with the policy. Well, they, they could might, say they're mortgaging your children. Yeah, but the media is yeah. not going to do it because, A, they agree with the policy. As, as ultimately, most liberals agree with the idea of democracy, bringing democracy and helping in Kosovo and helping in all these other places. It, it's consistent with their altruism. And secondly, <laughs> you know, you want it in terms of economics. These people can't even understand what raising taxes does to our, you know, the economy, this is much more abstract and difficult. And some of them even believe that wars, I mean, there's still the mythology that wars create economic activity. So, I mean, there's, there are all kinds of weird economic ideas out there in the culture. Thank you. Um, it seems that Americans in the West are very well educated um, in being able to take care of themselves, being able to make a good living and um, look look out for their own interests to a certain extent. Um, why do you think the, they are so easily deceived by the neocons? And what would it take, since objectivism does have truth and reality on its side, for them to actually see it? Um, and, and what would be your prognosis? Um, I don't think it's a question of being so easily deceived. It's that the assumption of the question is that <clears throat> kind of selfishness is obvious and that while Americans go out, they earn their living, they work hard. <clears throat> and so there, you have to do something to pull one over on, on, the, on the Americans. I think it's much more fundamental than that. It's that the only morality that has been preached for the last 2,000 years is altruism. And that is what resonates in people's mind as what it means to be moral. The other activities are relegated to the practical side. Well, you have to do that to stay alive, to make a living. <clears throat> so when you get uh, intellectuals like the neoconservatives who preach altruism, but say, well, in the long run, this is going to benefit you, that, okay, someone rational can think, okay, this is what morality means, and they're saying, well, if I practice morality, I'm going to benefit from it. So what is there to lose? Well, what you need for the American people to grasp, and it takes a long effort, is that there is another morality that rejects the whole concept of sacrifice, and that you have to give up for 20, 30, 50 years, and then somehow, in some distant future, you're going to achieve your utopia, which is what all the altruists preach in one form of another, from religion to the secular, secularization of religion with Nazism, communism, etc. So it's entrenched in the culture. Now, it's not something, well, 
they've somehow pulled some media coverage and got on Fox News or something like that, <laughs> and now everyone's deceived by them. It's that they preach altruism in its most palatable form, and that's why it's being swallowed by the American people. <clears throat> Yeah, and there's nothing unique about this. I mean, American people have swollen income tax. They've swollen the welfare state. They've swollen Social Security. They've swollen exactly the same recipe. How is Social Security sold to you? It's not sold as, you shall sacrifice for the sake of the greater good. It's sold as, look, you have to sacrifice a little bit today by getting less income, but in the long term, it'll benefit you somehow, and at the same time, it's good for society. You know, so all of, everything in American culture is, is, you know, in politics is today sold like that. So there's nothing unique about foreign policy. But I actually, related to your second point, what's it going to take uh, to, to, let, to have the Americans see this? I actually think that the war is an opportunity, in a sense, to show the American people that the consequence of altruism in a way that is you know, more real to them than it would be with taxes or with welfare or with, you know, things like that, because it's a life and death issue. People are actually dying. And I think it's incumbent on us, those, those of us who, who support objectivism, to point this out all the time on an active, in an active way. That's why this issue of foreign policy in Iraq is so important, for example, for the Iron Institute to, to, to bring up all the time, because it is a real you know, a uh, blood and guts example of the consequence of altruism, which is, which is often difficult to explain to people in abstract form. Here it is, people are actually dying in Iraq, and, it's, and people are questioning, people don't understand. On the one hand, they're pro-American and they wanted to go to war for, with Iraq because Saddam Hussein was a bad guy. On the other hand, it isn't working out the way they expected, so there's confusion. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to step in and say, this is why it's not working. This is the problem. This is the, you know, we went to Iraq for the wrong reason. This is what we should have done. And I, th I get very positive responses from Americans when I do that. And then, and then it's a good opportunity to bring up altruism and, and rational self-interest as an alternative to rational, to uh, altruism. And they can see it uh, in a much more concrete way than, than I think for other issues because it's life or death. It's immediate. Thank you. Assuming that we attack uh, and crush a legitimate threat, uh, under what conditions, if any, do you advocate that we uh, stay and, ex and expend time and money to impose a secular, uh, rational government on a nation? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so under what conditions would I advocate actually staying and, and you know, helping the country become a free country? And, and I think that A, you know, as you said, I think that, that a necessary step, assuming, is, is to crush the culture, to humiliate it, to make it clear and obvious to it that it is a failure and that it needs to look elsewhere for solutions. The second is there has to be some reason to think that this culture is open to reason and individualism or some sense of individualism. Uh, there has to be something in the culture that is pro-reason. Um, or there has to be some, um, you know, pattern in its history that suggests that they're interested in pursuing reason. So take, for example, Japan. Um, Japan, when we defeated it, was a pretty impressive industrial power. It built the most powerful aircraft carriers and military machinery known to man, you know, before they attacked Pearl Harbor and got us really mad, and we started building even better ones. But up to that point, they built stuff. Um, they had a real industry. They had a real economy. Uh, and why? Why did they have that? Because in the middle of the 19th century, they were opened up to the West. Uh, what was it? Admiral Perry, I think it was. Uh, Captain Perry opened up uh, Japan to the West. And they started taking uh, Western values. They introduced uh, Western schooling, they introduced Western industry. They even had, during periods in the 19th century, uh, elements of political freedom. In them. Now, I'm not an expert in Japanese history, but you can tell there must have been something about Japan that allowed people to be free enough at least to create the kind of stuff that they built in the 20s and 30s and 40s that led up to the war. Okay? And then they were taken over by, you know, 
by maybe a more ancient tradition in Japan, which is military kind of imperialism. The same in Germany. Germany had a certain culture pre-World War II. It had, there were elements within Germany that respected reason. It could have never become the kind of economic power that it became during the 19th and early 20th century without elements of reason within that culture. Now take the Middle East in contrast to that. There is not a thing, not one thing that the Middle East actually produces, that any country in the Middle East other than Israel produces. They don't build the weapons that they fight us with. They bought them from the Russians and from the Americans, right? They don't have an in industry. They don't have a culture. They, there's no indication that there's any pursuit of reason or any kind of individualism, at least since I don't know, 1200 AD. I mean, it's true. In, in that era, there was the pursuit of reason. I mean, they had a glory era, which was, which was a very good period of time. But since then, they've been mystical, they've been collectivistic, tribal, you know, barbaric. Um, and there's no indication over the last 50 years that that has changed in any significant way. So in a culture like that, I think the probability of being successful uh, after one crushes them, the probability of anything good coming out of it, unless one is willing to commit oneself to staying there for a generation is is minute, and therefore, I I don't think, and, and again, I don't think this this certainly is not philosophy talking. And philosophy doesn't, I don't think, have a principle here in terms of when and how long. I don't think it's legitimate for America to to, to stay in a country like that for fifty years in order to wait and educate and pour money into a culture in order to re-educate it, which I think is what it takes. It takes a generation. So. In my view, you destroy the enemy in a culture like that, and you get out of there, and you make it clear that any, if they raise their heads again, you will destroy them again. I think in Japan, it was more optional. That is, there was some basis from which to work with, to, you know, hold. And then, of course, when you do do it, you cram a constitution down their throat. You force them to change. You don't ask them to draft a constitution. You don't bring the tribal chiefs to, to a gathering to choose a constitution. You write the constitution and you force them to implement it, if you're going to do it at all. Okay. So those would be my preconditions. They, they, they would have to be a good reason to believe that you're going to be successful quickly. So it's an issue of what is going to be the cost. And, and if the cost minimal, um, then I can see one doing it, like in Japan. Uh, but if the cost is substantial, um, and the cost is in terms of what is the likelihood of them becoming a threat again, uh, and so on. But, you know, you could, you could turn Iraq into such a wasteland that they would never be a threat to the United States, not in many generations. So, and that, I would advocate that over what we're doing right now. Just, maybe just briefly, Iran is, is Iran a... Did you want to answer that? Yeah, I was going to just say one thing. So, I mean, Iran's discussing the preconditions that, that would make it possible for one to instill a better regime and turn it into a free country and that they don't exist in Iraq. But and I think you would agree with this part that, I mean, to do it where it's possible to do it, it still has to be in your self-interest. Oh, yeah. And I think it seldom is. And I think both Japan and Germany were not cases. Um, and Ayn Rand, for instance, was against the Marshall Plan, against all the aid being poured into uh, Western Europe after the war to bail them out of their own irrationalities. And I think that is almost always the case. There's a, I mean, it's hard to dream up a scenario where it would be necessary to impose a free regime on a country. You were asking about what, Iran? I was just wondering about Iran, if, if there was any possibility, like I, I've you know, heard mention of the groups, student yeah, groups. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, a, the, 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 there's a whole school of thought out there that, you know, I don't, I'm not an expert, so I, I don't know, but let me just speculate. There's a lot of people out there that claim that Iran has the solid pro-democracy, pro-Western, pro-individualism majority, you know, it's not even a minority or a substantial student movement or whatever. I am becoming more and more skeptical with time uh, about whether there truly is a pro-Western significant group in Iran. I think I think it's wishful thinking, uh, to a large extent, on the part of Iranians in the United States who would, who would like to believe that that's what their country is like. So in my view, 
in my view, when you go into Iran, there are, there are two options when, if, you go into Iran. Uh, you go in there, you know, and after you crush them and, and so on, you either, um, either there is this large pro-Western significant group that you can hand control over and get out of there quickly, or um, if there isn't, if it turns out there isn't, then I think the Iranians, we should provide the Iranians, make sure the Iranians have the infrastructure their philosophy deserves. In other words, I think we need to bring them back to the Stone Age and leave. Um, you destroy every piece of infrastructure that was built with, uh, with Western ingenuity and engineering and so on, and you get out of there and let them rot. Um, it's not our responsibility, and I agree completely with Dr. Goddard, it's not our responsibility, certainly, to establish democracy, to establish freedom anywhere, even after we've defeated a culture. It is a completely uh, an issue of our self-interest at that point in time. And, uh, you know, I think it's rare where you would envision the necessity of spending lives and resources in order to stay in a country if it was defeated properly in order to achieve that. Now, you, you might stay for military occupation in order to secure the place for a while, but then you leave them and, and, and let them, by their own resources, get back on their feet. It's not your responsibility to do that. It's indeed a moral travesty to take from the Americans who've just suffered through a loud, great depression, a World War II, hundreds of thousands of deaths in order to free Europe from the Nazis, and then we send them gazillions of dollars on top of that. I mean, that is a moral travesty towards the American people. I think it was in a, a New York State senatorial race 30 years ago or so that, that Ayn Rand commented about it being a, a crime against the present to vote for the liberal Democrat candidate, a crime against the future to vote for the conservative candidate. And uh, I think that was James Buckley, Is that was that his race? Yeah. And I just wondered, do you think that is, well, was it true then? And, and more importantly, is it true now, generally speaking, that it's it's worse probably to vote for a conservative candidate, particularly a neoconservative candidate. And what do you see as being the, the uh, worst threat, the, 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 the nihilist left or the religious right or uh, neoconservatives? Well, let me, let me put elections aside. We're non-for-profit and we can't comment on elections, so let me just, let, let's put that aside and let's deal with the, which one is a bigger threat and you can induce, you know, you can conclude from that what you will. Um, I think, in my view, the threat to the future of America today is from religion. Uh, there's no question that the nihilistic left is, is awful, it's dangerous, it's, it's you know, suicidal, it's nuts, uh, and would incredibly damage the United States. But I don't think that long term the nihilist left can come to dominate America. Americans, because of their positive sense of life, are not attracted to the zero which the nihilist left represents, to the nothingness, the emptiness, the destruction for the sake of destruction that the left today represents. Americans don't hate this country. They don't hate their own lives. They don't hate, you know, they, they don't want to go back to the caves. They don't want what the nihilist left wants. And they, Americans for the most part, believe in some sense that there's good and evil, that there's right and there's wrong. And the, and the left doesn't stand, even the non-nihilist radical left, the rest of the left doesn't stand for anything. There is nothing. So the left, the left has become a void. Um, the right is where you get fresh ideas. The right is where you get excitement and passion because they believe in good and evil, because they believe in right and wrong. So they get passionate about something. They get passionate about their view of what is right. And they are much more likely to inspire the American people to move in that direction, towards a direction of mysticism. Today, the option is either you believe in complete subjectivism, there is no such thing as right or wrong, or you believe in the Ten Commandments. That's it. Those are two only two alternatives presented out there. Um, and therefore, if you had a, you know, if you have to choose which one is long term going to have a bigger damage on the United States, I think it is the right. I think the neocons are setting the stage for the much more vicious right, the much more religious and mystical right to gain power. 
So the neocons are, in my view, a transition period between where we are today and the, the more, if you will, fascist right. And that is the real danger. They, because they're intellectual, they give, not only, they give a kind of intellectual legitimacy to religion. They give an intellectual legitimacy to Jerry Falwell and, 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 and that part of the conservative right. And that is, is part of their danger. So I view the right as, as far more dangerous. Thanks. There are several seemingly positive pro-freedom political changes that have occurred, say, in uh, Lebanon and Libya, which are said to be the effect of our policy in Iraq. How should we evaluate those changes? <laughs> well, let's see what happened in Lebanon. Okay. The Syrians blow up a previous prime minister. People go out into the street. By the way, the Lebanese didn't call it a cedar revolution. That was the name the CNN gave it. You know what they called it? They called it, I can't remember what the first word was, but something intifada, it, representing their sympathies with the uh, Palestinian intifada. They go into the streets. The Syrians symbolically leave, which is, a, I guess, a marginally good thing. Their, their troops are not there. Their intelligent forces are everywhere. Their agents are still in Lebanon. And Lebanon has an election, an election in which it returns to its old tribal roots of electing this particular Shiite and this particular Sunni and that particular Christian, and in forming a coalition government, the Hezbollah, gains power and gains a seat on the cabinet. So now you have, in my view, the most the most dangerous, well-equipped terrorist organization in the world sitting as a cabinet member on the government of the state of Lebanon to which Condoleezza Rice goes to visit while saying, oh, we don't like that the Hezbollah is on it, but she still recognizes the government and gives it its full sanction. So is that it? You know, before the Syrians were in Lebanon, Lebanon was part of Syria in a sense. You know, Syria was, never, was not a threat to the United States. I mean, Lebanon was not a threat to the United States. Lebanon was not a threat to Israel. Now, the Hezbollah has real political power in Lebanon. I believe that today, Lebanon is more of a threat to Israel and to the United States than it was before. So net, in terms of American self-interest, I think we're worse off. You know, Libya, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, after the invasion of Iraq, uh, handed over his supposed programs of weapon mass destruction. If we're to believe him, he's cleaned out the place. He's not going to follow weapons. And maybe that's true. And maybe Iraq did cause him to do that. Imagine what he would have done if they'd done what I advocate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he would have become groveling and handed over the oil as well, together with his <laughs> weapons of mass destruction. And I think to a large extent why he did, he did it, notice what happened immediately after he did that. The U.S. lifted restrictions on oil companies, and we went over there to pump more oil so that Libya could make more money to hand over to more terrorists in more countries around the world. Uh, where else has there been freedom because of Iraq? Ukraine? I mean, let me just say for the record that uh, Ukraine might have been marginally impacted by the elections in Iraq, but I believe that the Ukraine is the consequence of a what is it, 15 years, 16 years, movement since the fall of the Berlin Wall of freedom slowly creeping through uh, the former communist countries. It was going to become, the, the, the Orange Revolution was going to happen one way or another. You know, maybe it would have taken longer without Iraq. It, I don't think so. I think it would have happened anyway. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a sudden historical, not destiny, but it's a sudden historical movement. Communism is dead. It's just a question of these people slowly rebelling uh, against their local little dictators as the countries next door to them have and as they see the relative freedom overseas. And even there, look what a mess, I don't know if you've been following over the last couple of weeks, the mess that's created in the Ukraine. So, you know, I think that Iraq uh, has not really done anything uh, to promote freedom in the rest of the world. And indeed, it's long-term consequences that are crushed freedom and to promote Islamic fundamentalists dominating governments of countries all over the Middle East, starting, not dominate, but starting with the presence in the Lebanese government, 
but they, they're going to dominate Iraq's government. I mean, the, the uh, Supreme Council for the uh, Islamic Revolution in Iraq did win the election. They are the people in charge in Iraq today. They're one of the coalition partners, the, the largest coalition partner in the uh, Shiite, Shiite uh, coalition alliance. So Islamic, in my view, totalitarian Islam is on the march in the Middle East. It is getting more and more powerful. It is getting more and more emboldened with every day that we spend in Iraq, you know, doing nothing to, to crush the real enemy that we face. And, and watching American soldiers die in the hands of totalitarian Islam and us doing nothing, which just emboldens them to do more. So Iraq is, a, in my view, a disaster from A to Z and will only bring more oppression and more danger to the United States. More oppression to Middle East countries and more danger to the United States. Thank you. Uh, I'll just add a point. I mean, I think this was covered in the lecture in the sense um, that he said that they want moral legitimacy. And if in the eyes of America, this is what it takes to be legitimate, to hold elections. Every country in the Middle East will say Iran holds elections, Egypt holds elections. Look, we're moving towards freedom. We're holding elections. That will stop the bombs from falling us. And it's the easiest thing in the world to do. So to view that, and I know there's many people who view it, even within objectivism, as this is evidence for the spread of freedom, I think is bizarre. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really important point, this issue of sanction. They, 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 you know, this gets, every country that holds election now gets real big points from the United States and, and Europe. They are now joining the civilized world because they've held elections. Even if they elect those elections results in the same old regime coming to power, like in Egypt with Mubarak now, or a worse regime coming to power, like in Iraq, or potentially in Syria, or potentially in Egypt, if they really held true elections. Mubarak held this election very close to the vest. They only approved candidates could run, but if they really ran in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood would win. And you know who the Muslim Brotherhood is? They're the intellectual founders of this entire totalitarian Islamic movement. It all started in Egypt in the 1920s and 30s, them and the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia. So, and, that, and, and they would say, hey, we won democratically. And Bush has already said, if you win democratically, you're okay. You join the United Nations, we'll give you most favored nations. You can, you know, Saudi Arabia, I think, is now joining the uh, World Trade Organization. I mean, there's no end to, probably because they hold municipal elections. <laughs> Doctors Brooks and Gatte, uh, if I could please get both of your opinions on this. Um, what do you think the mechanism will be for the United States becoming a, an actual capitalist society? Do you think it will be an intellectual revolution, like a physical revolution, sort of like a shrugging event? Or do you think another nation will become capitalist and sort of outpace us? <laughs> um, you know, I don't think another country will become capitalist and outpace it, although let me know if there's a candidate out there. Maybe we should move the institute. Um, <laughs> You know, I don't know what the exact mechanism is going to be. I just don't know. But I, I'll tell you this, that it will definitely be an intellectual revolution. How it exactly plays out is hard to tell. Whether it gets to the point where it's a, an armed revolution, it might at some point have to be a physical revolution in that sense. I, I just don't know. Uh, I hope not. But um, the, way I, the way I see it is that more and more uh, professors at universities are teaching Ayn Rand. Uh, more and more students read Ayn Rand in high school and in college. Uh, more and more people uh, are exposed to Ayn Rand's ideas through lectures like this and through the media. That Ayn Rand's ideas slowly seep through into the culture and start having an effect on, on the journalists who write in the newspapers, on the talking heads on, on the TV shows in the movies and the art that is being uh, created that slowly has that kind of effect. And yeah, at some point, the right and the left will look around and say, these guys are the enemies, <laughs> the real enemies. And, and they'll come after us. And then you know, it, it'll get heated, and it'll, there'll be big debates. But the debates will be on 
fundamental intellectual philosophical issues. They'll be about altruism versus egoism. They'll be about reason versus faith. That's what it's going to boil down to. And those debates, when they're out in the open, when, they, when a debate like that attracts huge numbers of people, whether it's on TV or whether it's in a hall like this, that's when you know the revolution is, is coming, is, is right there. So we at the Institute, our goal is to make that happen and to make that happen within our lifetimes. That is to bring Ayn Rand's ideas into the culture, to make them prevalent so that nobody will not know who Ayn Rand is and what she stood for, to present an alternative to faith and to altruism. Whether it's the fact that we, you know, we will be, in this next school year, we will be distributing 300,000 books to, to teachers who want to teach Ayn Rand in the classroom. So 300,000, well, actually, if you count the books we've distributed in the past couple of years, almost half a million kids will be reading uh, Ayn Rand you know, this coming year, and, and w with your help, I want that to be, you know, two million kids, which would make it you know, close to 20% of, of all high school students. If we can get 20% of all high school students reading the books, if we can then train you intellectuals at the Institute, if we can then open up universities, and the universities are opening up to, uh, to objectives, when we can place professors, then we will change this culture. I mean, look what the left did. In a much less, with a much less coherent goal, just because they had the ideas from the 19th century through today, how they've dominated and taken over the culture. Uh, that's what we need to do. We need to start at the universities and at the high schools and, and slowly take over the culture. And I think it happens here. I can't see it happening anywhere else in the world, primarily because they don't have Ayn Rand. They don't have uh, the right philosophies. They can, they can become for a while more capitalistic even maybe than we are, but for a while, because without the right ideas, that won't survive. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely with what Yaron said. And just to look at the, the first part of the question of, and Yaron's answer, that, well, you can't predict what is going to happen and exactly how freedom will uh, regain its foothold in America. <clears throat> if you were transported back in time to the start of the Renaissance, <clears throat> when the, the Christian philosophy is, is being replaced by a philosophy of reason. And if you ask, well, how are we going to get a, a nation that's founded on what became the Enlightenment ideals of reason, individualism, secularism, science? There's no way to predict that it's going to happen in America. It's going to be through a revolution amongst the two freest nations, the U.S. and Britain, to get the freest country there has ever been, the United States in its founding. I mean, you couldn't predict that at that time. And I think it's the same here. You can say, yeah, it definitely will require an intellectual revolution. But when the ideas are out there, how exactly people act on them and move towards freedom, I don't think you can predict. Thank you. Dr. Brooke, um, you <clears throat> gave some mention to the new Iraqi constitution um, as being a uh, jumble of self-contradictory uh, elements. Uh, I would like to know a little bit more. For example, uh, one prominent mullah said as the uh, constitution was being drafted um, that uh, whatever it says, it must not be out of phase with Quranic teaching or the teaching of the Sharia. So my first branch of my question is, uh, what was the final outcome? It seems to me you've probably read the thing or read about it. Um, and the other question which is, goes along with it is, uh, is there anything that even resembles a Bill of Rights in that Constitution? Well, Dr. God has actually recently read it, so he probably knows oh. in more detail than I do. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's the worst possible document you could imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and. <clears throat> If you put the left and the religious right in a room and told them to write a constitution, this is what you would get. <laughs> so, I, I mean, not seriously. So everything that the left, and they had a lot of Westerners um, advising them on the writing of this constitution. And you can see it's the kind of tribal mentality that exists in Iraq, elevated with Western-sounding language and what the left advocates and what the religious right advocate. So take the left side. <clears throat> it's a complete government control of national health care, insurance, private property can be taken for the public interest, 
<clears throat> with just compensation. But public property is sacrosanct. There's, there's tons of things about diversity, about protecting the environment, all the causes of the left. So it's a complete material control of the economy, public, oil. <clears throat> and then it's what the religious right wants. It's that it's in terms of the, the spiritual side of life, it's controlled by religion. So religion is to be a basic source of the law. <clears throat> there's religious leaders sitting on the Supreme Court <clears throat> and on and on. I mean, there's, there's tons. So it's, it's religion controlling the spiritual side and it's the left's view of, well, we need to control the body, we need to control matter. It's that fused together into what they call a constitution. Um, so, I mean, it's the worst document you could possibly imagine. <clears throat> Thank you very yeah, much. And, this, and that we fought to do this, I mean. Yeah. <clears throat> well, still dying to yeah. do this. I mean, that's, that's a tragedy. And there is no, I don't think there's any semblance of a Bill of Rights. And, and to the extent that they use the verbiage of rights, uh, you know, there's something about you have the right to speech as long as it doesn't offend anybody. It doesn't, offend, it doesn't offend public, public morality. Public morality. That is, it's yeah. not against religion. religion. Yeah. So it, it's a horrific document and, and just a, a moral travesty that, that it's being done under the auspices of America and is being sanctioned by America, you know, and, and is hailed by an American president and, and, uh, and, and really all our intellectuals. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, I guess I have a question. Just thinking about what we've talked about tonight, it seems like the, um, what we're really needing to fight is irrationality. It seems like kind of the core of the issue, if, whether you look at um, you know, radical Islam or really teachings of probably most religions, ultimately you're dealing with the, irrational, the rationality issue. And I guess I was wondering a little bit about the basis for rationality. Is there, would there not be a good, um, a good thing to support would be the basis for thinking and rational thinking. And maybe epistemology, I guess, is what I'm, I'm thinking of. Isn't that kind of a fundamental thing we could support that might eventually in the next generation help to maybe solve a lot of this if we could try to impart that type of basis for rationality? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that if we go back to what the Institute does, one of the things that we do is we train new, what Ayn Rand called the new intellectuals, and they're to be advocates of reason. So the, the foundation of the training is to help them understand what reason is and then to become teachers of this, of, of a proper view of the human mind, of how it gains knowledge. And it's, <clears throat> it's to advocate reason, but also that there's a rational morality that, <clears throat> And I think that's part of what is tearing apart America. It's this split between the practical side, we follow reason, but the moment we get to morality, reason is gone, we have to have faith, we have to believe in God, etc. What you need to do to restore this culture to what it was when it was founded, when America was founded, <clears throat> is to, to get out the idea that there is a rational morality. That is one of Ayn Rand's tremendous achievements to advocate reason and morality all the way down to, to defining values, virtues, it's reason everywhere. <clears throat> so I, I mean, we certainly agree, I think, that that's what this culture needs and that is pr the primary activity of the Institute. It's to get reason out into the culture. <clears throat> I'm puzzled um, with uh, maybe the logic that's been laid out. So, so let me ask the question this way. If suddenly the neoconservatives got your message and woke up the next day and said, okay, we'll stop being altruistic. We'll stop paying for all the billions of dollars we've been sending to Israel for the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. In your view, what would happen to Israel and how might that affect this entire Middle East situation? Well, I mean, there's a big difference between sending billions of dollars to Israel but, uh, and, and between sending them to Iraq. Israel is an ally fighting the same war that we're fighting. They're helping in the same mission that, that we're, you know, we're advocating for. Granted that, I don't think America should send a dime to Israel. Uh, not unless, you know, it's clear cut in, in some way in its self-interest, and it's not, and in my view, it's not in Israel's interest. Just like any welfare recipient, 
Israel's economy has been handicapped by the fact that they receive all this aid. It's been devastated. Now, that's not the reason America shouldn't give it aid. It shouldn't give it aid because it doesn't need it and it shouldn't get it. They shouldn't be taking our money and, and divvying it out to Israelis or to anybody else. Our money's ours. Now, if you, we all want to get together and, uh, and give Israel money, that's great. We should all get together and give Israel money. All America has to do in order for Israel to thrive and to beat the enemy is to sell Israel weapons and to sell Israel any weapon that Israel wants. Any weapon that Israel wants. It doesn't have to give Israel a dime. A dime. And as I said, indeed, Israel is crippled by American financial support, by taxpayer support. Israel would have become more capitalist and freer probably. I mean, it, it could have self-destructed if it had been allowed to suffer the consequence of its own socialist policies and hopefully turn around from them. Uh, so I don't advocate supporting Israel financially qua the U.S. government. I don't think that's, uh, that's the right use of, uh, of our money. Uh, if, again, individuals who support Israel, that's fine. But it's also important to understand the distinction between Israel and Iraq. Israel is our ally, is our friend in this battle. Iraq is our enemy. There's nothing in the culture of Iraq that, that is supportive of our goals in the Middle East. Evening. Um, I actually had a, an issue to address. You stated earlier that religion is actually an attack on reason and rationale and that we must move it out of the way. It's only here for morality as sort of faith-based only. But uh, from my studies, uh, from what I know from school, all the major philosophers were uh, Christian, where that would be Isaac Newton, scientist, or C.S. Lewis. Um, in addition, morality, this, this abstract notion of morality by faith only is actually supported through something called natural law. I'm sure you gentlemen are aware of it, whereby some things which are set about by our religion reflect like a healthy lifestyle. And I think this is actually across uh, many religions, not just Christianity or Judaism for that matter. Can you please address that issue and the correlation with uh, religion and rationale? <clears throat> um, well, first take the essence of religion and religious morality, um, <clears throat> which is basically the idea that it's right because God says so, or that you should do it because God says so. So you can take the story of Abraham and Isaac, because it really, this reveals the essence of religious morality. God commands him to sacrifice his son, to kill his son. Now why? Why should he do it? This command is unintelligible to him, but he's to do it anyway. <clears throat> what possible value could he gain in killing his own son? He can't figure out any, but he's to do it anyway. So he's has no rational conviction of why this is right, and he can see no value to gain. And yet he's to do it, because God says it's right, so it must be right. So it's to toss out your judgment and your choice of values. And that's the, it's to toss your rational judgment and your rational choice of what is in my self-interest. It's to toss reason aside and to obey, to have faith, to do your duty. The essence of religion is to toss reason aside and have faith, <clears throat> whether you're looking in the field of knowledge or the field of morality. So it's one or the other. It's either I go by my rational judgment and my rational selection of values, or I abandon that and go by what someone commands me. I mean, some alleged being in another dimension through the voices of the, whatever religious prophet or leader he's supposed to follow. So it's, it's, I mean, they're complete. It's faith versus reason. They're complete opposites. <clears throat> and there have been, in the history of the West, rational approaches to science, to morality, that are non-religious. That's what you find in ancient Greece. It's only after the rise of Christianity and the attempt then from the Renaissance onwards to secularize the human mind, to get rid of religion, that you find, uh, so I mean what you're calling a fusion of reason and faith, and it, these are thinkers who are trying to get rid of faith. <clears throat> They're trying to go by reason, 
but they're unable to do so. And there, there are many tragedies in philosophy post-Renaissance. I mean, you can look at Descartes, Leibniz, Newton, Locke, uh, <coughs> Hume. In one way or another, they're trying to get faith out and to go by reason. But what always ends up happening is <coughs> it collapses into skepticism, that we can't gain knowledge and we can't find a moral code, that if we go by reason, anything goes. So they're unable to do it, but that is not the same as saying there's a fusion of the two. It's an attempt to secularize the human mind, and it fails. And that, again, is precisely one of Ayn Rand's great achievements. She's, since the time of the Greeks, she's the first philosopher who advocates reason and doesn't collapse either into skepticism or subjectivism, into this kind of anything goes mentality that you see on the left. <clears throat> but it takes a lot of intellectual work in order to be able to do that. Um, so in the principle, faith and reason are distinct, they're opposites, even if they're found commingled in a particular thinker, which you see all over the West after the rise of Christianity. <clears throat> It, and to the extent that these thinkers really do achieve something, like Isaac Newton, is it is in that realm of their life where they are completely dedicated to reason and they don't let faith in. So nothing that Isaac Newton really achieved came as an inspiration from God to him. It was all worked out from the facts of reality, looking at reality and using his reason in order to induce truths about the real world. It was not through mystical revelation. You don't get science, you don't get calculus, which he was one of the people who invented, I think, uh, from meditation. You get it from the applying your mind to, the prop, to, to reality, to facts. Uh, so to the extent that there were achievements, even by people who advocated for Christianity, is the extent to which they didn't allow Christianity didn't allow faith to enter into their lives. And the more dedicated they truly were to faith and to Christianity, the fewer achievements they could have had and the less success they could have had. Um, uh, you mentioned earlier that um, religion, uh, well, you were talking about altruism, but also you mentioned uh, 2,000 years of religion that it's so intrinsically ingrained in, in cultures all over the world. And by um, uh, objectivism discarding re religion, um, don't you see that as a, as a huge obstacle to the, the spread of the objectivistic ideas just because people almost instinctively react ad adversely uh, to uh, concepts that discard religion. And uh, I wanna say this um, uh, because I, for example, I believe in God, but at the same time, I think that religion is a really bad thing. And uh, do you think that it is a valid concept to think that um, uh, we can apply objectivism without giving up the idea of believing in God because uh, um, there are, we can look at God not as religion but as separate from it, as an entity that created all these natural laws that rule our existence and that objectivism is the most efficient way to live by those rules. <clears throat> um, no, I don't think it's possible to mix objectivism with any advocacy of the supernatural. And when you talk about a God who creates the world, you're talking about something that transcends the natural world, the world that we know exists, that it is what it is, that obeys causal law. There's some entity sitting above this that controls that, that can change it at its will. <clears throat> if you actually believe that, then you have to deny that reason has validity, because he can change the rules anytime. The only way you can know the universe is to know God and how he created it, which is what all the thinkers then focus their whole attention on. We have to turn our attention away from the natural world to its source and to its creator. 
And if you believe that, you've jettisoned, you jettisoned both reason and you jettison this world, this reality, and we're to focus by some non-rational means on some a superior dimension. <clears throat> so an objectivism is a philosophy that advocates reality as an absolute and reason as an absolute. The universe is all there is. It's what exists, it's where you live, and it's what you have to know in order to stay alive. And your means of knowing it is reason, period. So there's no room for the supernatural in such a view. <clears throat> Um, don't you find that um, a lot of the uh, concept, most advanced concepts in, in physics, uh, such as the unified, uh, unified uh, theory, or the unified force, and uh, leads towards something uh, uh, per se unifying that could be defined by some as God? No, um, <clears throat> and. I mean, leave aside the state of modern physics. No genuine scientific investigation into the natural world could lead you to posit a world that transcends and contradicts the natural world, which is what the supernatural world is. <clears throat> All that scientific investigation leads to is more knowledge of the natural world. So <clears throat> there's, again, no opening for a supernatural dimension. In I, that kind yeah, of I guess I just identify the natural world with with a trans transcendental uh, world, but that's, I guess. Yeah. I mean, we can talk about that after this, but I mean, <laughs> okay. that's a complete contradiction. Yeah. So. Thank you for your answer. If I may just kind of piggyback on the last two or three uh, questioners. Um, without uh, relying on, and I like the differentiation that one of them made between religion and God, um, without reliance on, on the concept of, of a supreme being, God, um, on what do you base, uh, you had mentioned the concept of right and wrong and good and bad. Now what becomes the standard by which you evaluate those concepts? I mean, the standard becomes your life and its requirements, <clears throat> or put more abstract, abstractly, man's life. <clears throat> so let's step back. Why does one need a morality? That is the question that Ayn Rand begins with in her investigations into the field of ethics and developing her theories. It's not, well, what moral code should I adapt, adopt, but why do I need one in the first place? And the reason you need one is that you're a living being <clears throat> who has to survive. But unlike other animals, that does not come inbuilt in you. You don't know what values to pursue or how to pursue them. You don't know how, I mean, just take simple things like food, clothing, shelter. You don't, you know, when you're born, you don't know that you need these things or how to achieve them. And I mean, there's many more values of that from an advanced industrial civilization to the need of friendship to the need of love. All these things are, are needs of a living organism, of a, of a man, of a human being. <clears throat> Yet you don't know how to achieve them, and you don't even know that they're values in the first place. And that are the, those are the types of things that the science of ethics teaches you. They teach you what are the requirements to live and prosper and to achieve happiness. So what are they, and then how do I achieve them? By what principles do I have to act and live by in order to achieve my life and my happiness? And that, in essence, is what morality as a field, as a scientific field, is devoted towards. And so the standard becomes the requirements of human life. That which furthers life, human life, is good. That which threatens and destroys it is evil. <clears throat> So, I mean, I mean, there's much more to say, but that gives you a, at least a headway into Ayn Rand's approach to ethics. And now, just as an aside, to think that religion can give you an answer to right and wrong, so it's uphold as well, the only way to have absolutes in morality is through religion. That, I mean, is a bizarre notion. And it, go back to the story of Isaac and Abraham. The whole point of the story, and, and, and religious figures take this as revealing the essence of morality, is that it's whatever God says it is. 
If he tells you to kill your son, that's good. If he tells you later, oh, I was just kidding, then now it would be bad to kill your son. There is no absolute here. It's you're dependent on God's will. It's supernatural subjectivism. There's no difference between that and a kind of personal subjectivism of an Al Capone coming along and saying, what's right? It's what I say. It's what I say goes. And you just have a, a, a supernatural version of that same mentality. And to view that as giving you absolutes in ethics is, I mean, it's a complete reverse of the truth. The only way you can have absolutes in ethics if it's based on reality, which is an absolute, the requirements of staying in reality, of living and achieving happiness. And that is what a scientific approach to ethics, that's where it begins. <clears throat> uh, just, to, just to add to that, uh, I recommend if you're interested in the virtue of selfishness, read the virtue of selfishness written by Ayn Rand, um, where she goes into a lot more detail about you know, a rational approach to morality. Just to tie this back to the subject of Iran's talk, the essence of the ideological enemy that we are fighting is reduced to a fairly simple statement, and that is, God has spoken to me, and God has told me what you have to do. God has also told me that if you don't do what I have told you to do, I should kill you. What is the only proper rational response <laughs> to such a statement and such a policy? Well, obviously anybody who wants to kill me, we need to kill him first. Um, but, it, but, it, but I think, I, I think the, point, the broader point is that there's no that the fundamental character of Islamic fundamentalism as God has told me therefore X is fundamentally the same as any religious uh, character. The, you know, God has told uh, the Jews something else and God has told the Christians something else, but it's still the same arbitrary uh, decisions and indeed, indeed Christians if you go long, uh, you know, far enough back into the past, we're told by God to kill people you know, the, during the Inquisition. And indeed, Jews, if you, if you read the Old Testament carefully, Jews are told by God to wipe whole people out. You know, not a seed among them shall remain. You should kill every man, woman, child, and animal. That's in the Old Testament. That's what God told the Jews. Now he's telling it to the Muslims. Once you accept that kind of completely arbitrary, uh, otherworldly, unreal uh, guidance, then anything is possible. And it doesn't matter what the name of the particular religion is. The, the fundamental problem is religion, is the acceptance of that arbitrary statement. And, and it's exactly right. There is no, what absolute right or wrong? Well, absolute right or wrong based on a Protestant, a Catholic, a Jew, a Muslim. What kind of Muslim? A moderate Muslim? A fundamentalist Muslim? A, you know, where is the absolute right or wrong that religion provides or that God provides anybody? It's not. Because the only way to communicate with God, well, what is it? I mean, there is no right way to communicate with God. So you're dependent on some Messiah, and each Messiah is going to interpret it differently, and each interpreter of the interpreter is going to interpret it differently. But they're all fundamentally the same. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice for nothing. For zero. Um, I, I got a couple comments and a, and a question. Uh, gentlemen, first, thank you uh, for, for your comments today. I learned quite a bit, and I found myself uh, actually agreeing with, with many of your comments. Um, but let me get back to what the topic was, which was the critique of U.S. foreign policy mm -hmm. post 9-11, specifically dealing with neoconservatives. Uh, help me understand how 50 million people being liberated from oppressive regimes, especially in Afghanistan, like you mentioned, is not in America's self-interest given the terrible tragedy of four years ago. <laughs> there is, because 
what we forget is the uh, 2,500 American lives that had to be, that were lost in order to supposedly liberate these people. I mean, I don't think any of them are liberated. Afghanistan will not survive 10 days after the Americans leave as a liberated country, and neither will Iraq. The point is this. The responsibility of the American government and the milita American military is one and one only, and that is the protection of the individual rights of Americans, of free Americans of this country. And that does not require liberating Afghans. It requires killing, killing every last one of those people who threaten the lives of Americans, period. So you don't let the tribal lords of Afghanistan fight a war that you should be fighting and therefore let bin Laden escape from Tarabora. You should read the article in, in uh, this weekend's New York Times in the magazine section about what happened in Tarabora and how the, uh, our U.S. military sent a dozen special forces troops to Tarabora and let, Saddam was, and let uh, bin Laden escape in spite of the fact that a Marine general wanted to put 5,000 Marines there, and he would be dead today. Dead with 2,000 terrorists. No, no, the, I, point, the point is this. The point of a war is to destroy your enemy. The point of the war is to kill the bad guys. The point of a war is to make sure that nobody ever threatens the United States again. Not to liberate Afghans, not to liberate Iraqis. Now, if after you've done that, you've killed the bad guys who threatened you, the Afghans are liberated and they establish their own free country. Wonderful for the Afghans. I will rejoice with everybody else. But not one drop of American blood should be spilt in order to liberate the Afghans or in order to liberate the, Af the, the Iraqis. American soldiers should be placing their life at risk for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to protect their and our lives. War is a selfish, should be a selfish pursuit of self-defense. No, I, I agree. That, that, is, that is fantastic. That, we're, we're, we're not going to be made safer by liberating, you're, you're right, uh, you know, Afghanis, Iraqis, whoever, but we are charged, this, this nation and, and the soldiers that defend us with protecting against us against enemies, Absolutely. For, I'm not foreign against and domestic. War. I've never been against war, right? I mean, I mentioned, I, you know, we should, have war, we should have fought the war in Afghanistan to win not to appease the Afghani tribal lords. We should have fought the war in Iraq. We, don't, we didn't need to fight the war in Iraq. Iraq wasn't the enemy. The Iranians are the enemy. We should have fought the war in Iraq in a way that would have stopped Islamic terrorism against the United States forever. Not by bringing them social services and water, but by destroying any remnants of infrastructure that provides them with water. So the way to fight a war is to destroy your enemy, not to provide them with social services and democracy. So that is my complaint about the neocons. Not that we went to war, but that we went to war for the wrong reason and as a consequence fought the war in the wrong way. And we continue to do that, by the way, with the insurgency in Iraq, where everyday American troops are dying. Why? Because we're not willing to do what is necessary to end the insurgency, which has become a lot tougher than we are today. Thank you, sir. Hi. I, <clears throat> just a little follow-up on some of the conversation that went on earlier um, regarding, as you pointed out, the problems, some of the problems with religion and the fact that our enemy is, uh, if not, if the terrorists aren't intrinsically um, religious, religion is being used to motivate them. Uh, going back to the, you know, the Jado Christian tradition here in America, <clears throat> I don't think there's any problem with using reason to uh, come up with commandments two through ten. Is that true? You can well, let me, let me first address your first comment, because let me, let me make this very clear. The terrorists are the epitome of their religion. It is not true that they don't represent religion and they are somehow distorting 
a great religion or not so great religion, it doesn't matter. They are the epitome of self-sacrifice. They do this, not, they do this because they believe that there are 72 virgins waiting for them. They do this because that's, the religion has told them that this is a good thing to do. Uh, you know, let's not hide behind it's being, religion is being used here in some subvertive way in order to inspire these people. They, this is part of, of who they are and what they are, and, and they truly believe in this religion when they fly airplanes in the building. Now, as to the second to the tenth commandments, and I'm not up on my tenth commandments, so, so I don't remember not all of them. Not in your office? Detail. They're not okay, in my office, no. Um, but I did, I did as, a, as a child study them quite thoroughly, so I should be familiar with them, but, I, but I'm not. Um, no. Reason does not come to the same. i give you, give you for example. Thy shall honor thy father and thy mother. Why? What if my father abuses me? What if he's an abusive father? What if he is a nasty father? What if he's a lousy human being? He doesn't abuse me. He's just a crummy person. Why should I honor him? By what rational reason does it make sense for me to honor my father? Um, what are some of the other ones? Thou, shalt, uh, <laughs> thou know, shalt not it, steal. Yeah, the point is that why shouldn't you steal? Why? Now, I don't think you should steal. But the Old Testament gives me no reason not to steal other than God said so. God said thou shalt not steal, then you shouldn't steal. Yeah. God said you should kill your eldest son. So kill your eldest son. God said to jump off the Empire State Building. So you jump off. I mean, that is not a basis for action in life. I want to know why. I'm, I'm still at the, you know, the three-year-old stage. Why? Yeah. And the Old Testament, and I've read it several times, gives no answers to the question of why other than because God said so and therefore you should do it. I want rational reasons for that. Uh, and, and therefore, no rational philosophy is going to provide you with ten commandments. It's going to provide you with values that you should pursue. Why? Because yes. this is a way for you to gain happiness and life and success and prosperity and everything else associated with a successful life. I guess my, my question was just a, maybe misinterpreted yeah. by you. It was the <laughs> fact that 2 through 10, uh, let's put aside, we can maybe have a longer discussion on honoring your father and your mother. Yeah. But thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. Oh, I, 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 I take objection with I shall not all kill all because all I, I believe we should be killing militant Islamists. Exactly. So there are, uh, let's use a leftist term, <laughs> there are nuances to thou shalt not kill. Obviously, you're going to kill somebody who you think <laughs> is going to or is trying to kill you, right? And we kill a lot. We kill to live, don't we? So. The, no, I think, we don't. I so think in, sure a, in a certain sure. way, the Ten Commandments are an abbreviated, simple version of a code of conduct that you can give to a five-year-old. However, later on, when you're using your reason, I don't really see a problem with, let's call them the rules, two through ten. In, a, in arriving at those through reason, and it's true that there's more to it than thou shalt not kill. There are variations, right? Well, the, but well, you can't, you can't give But you those. can't you call can't a variation those. thou shalt kill. I mean, well, no, there's, the, the, it's, there's a difference between manslaughter and Well, sure, there are variations. Murder. Partially, it's a bad translation. In right. Hebrew, it's thou shalt not murder, not thou shalt not kill. So you've got that too. But let me, let me put it. My point is the whole the issue of point killing is this, other human you beings. You don't need them. You don't need them. That is, I can teach my five-year-old kid morality without inventing an, a, 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 a supernatural being and scaring the kid into believing that if he doesn't follow these commandments, he's going to go to hell. Yes. There is much better, more life-oriented, more reality-oriented to teach ways, easy ways, it's not hard, to teach a kid not to steal, that murdering is a bad thing, that lying... Is, is wrong. There are easy ways to do that without invoking a supernatural being which doesn't exist. So lying to your kid in order to teach them not to lie. So the thing is that you don't need any of that because reason supplies you with a much better 
with a, with, a, with a correct, not a much better, a correct code of ethics that is meaningful in life, that is real, that is true, and that is aimed not at satisfying the whims of a God, but is aimed at your own success, your own happiness, your own life. And it, I mean, it's more, it destroys the idea of morality in a rational child's mind because he gets the idea <clears throat> that there's no earthly reason why I shouldn't steal, why I shouldn't lie. I mean, leave aside that these are not actual principles. They're just um, <clears throat> out of context commandments. But he gets the idea that if he was following reason, I shouldn't be moral. The only reason I should be moral is that there's this supernatural being floating around me who's going to send me to hell if I uh, disobey morality. So it pits morality against reason. <clears throat> so it's far more than just, well, it's, you're not teaching them the right thing. You're teaching them a profoundly wrong idea. And, and for any rational kid who says, I'm going by reason, it becomes in his mind to hell with morality if it's based on the supernatural and commandments. <clears throat> I think that's a a a, uh, a flaw <laughs> that a lot of people, most people in the country would have trouble because they haven't thought about it. No, I, absolutely. I mean, it. it's <laughs> it's, but it's not a flaw. <laughs> no, I'm I'm saying the flaw of how do you arrive at these. Well, I mean, that's but what we need to educate people is, is not in how do you arrive at are. those Ten Commandments, but in chucking the Ten Commandments and coming up with a rational system of ethics that is pro-life and pro-happiness and that is based on a scientific examination of the nature of man, on the nature of life. And it, it, that's what we need. We need to stop. Uh, lying to our kids, you know, and 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 uh, distorting their ability to be moral. There's a lady behind you. Can you comment on North Korea and the neocons' position <laughs> in Asia? Wow. <laughs> um, can I comment on North Korea? It's a mess. <laughs> And it's a mess because of years and years and years of appeasement, whether it was under, it turns out the whole North Korea situation started like in 1978, I think it was. And it's a series of appeasement by the Carter administration and the Reagan administration and the Bush administration, of course the Clinton administration, which we're all familiar, and now the Bush administration. We continuously appease this dictatorship. We continuously uh, feed them, help them, assist them, and they keep blackmailing us more and more and more, and we keep buying into that. So the first thing that has to be done is not, a, I mean, they talk about, should we have bilateral meeting or multilateral meetings? No meetings, not a single meeting, not by, no American should meet any North Korean, and no American ally should meet any North Korean. None whatsoever, and let them starve. And then if we perceive them as a real threat, then we should take out the threat. If, if we perceive those. Now it's complicated because they have missiles aimed at uh, South Korea and, and Seoul might be really damaged and so on. That's why it has to be a real threat. We really believe they're going to launch an attack against the West before we launch a military attack. But there's so many things we could do that are non-military. Not feed them, for example. Tell, tell the Chinese that if they continue to cooperate with them, we won't trade with them. You know, tell the Chinese that we won't let them go and get into the World Trade Organization if they keep halting the North Korea. There are lots of things that could be done. And of course the neocons, you know, don't really have a North Korean policy. Um, so, so we see what Bush is doing. It's, it's, they call them evil, but they don't really do anything about it. They talk to them, but they don't talk to them. They're multilateral talks, but not bilateral talks. We'll appease them, but not too much. I mean, that's what it comes to. Uh, there is no coherent strategy with regard to North Korea other than appeasement. Okay, last question. Okay. Um, in that last response, you talked about uh, not trading with China. Uh, could I please get you to elaborate on that and talk about the moral status of embargoes? 
Well, I think that embargo is a completely moral. If a country is an enemy of yours, nobody in your country should be trading with that country. That is, if a country is a clear threat to you and has threatened you and has aimed nuclear weapons at you and so on, like the Soviet Union was clearly, then you should not allow private individuals within your country to trade with that country because they are they're basically committing treason. They're helping a country that is threatening the lives of your citizens and as part of your responsibility defending the individual rights of your own citizens, that's what you should do. So uh, I think it's com it, 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 as an act of self-defense, embargoes are completely appropriate and I think the Soviet Union was, 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 the, was one example of an embargo that should have been enforced and of course wasn't. We fed the Soviet Union. I mean, they couldn't grow wheat in the richest, most fertile land on earth. They couldn't grow wheat, so we provided them with wheat for, for decades and decades, even before detente. So th that's when I think embargoes are appropriate, where the government, t w the only, the situation where the, 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 the government tells private individuals that they cannot trade with an enemy. It would be like, well, I can't think of a domestic um, similarity. You know, it would be like allowing people to help a serial murderer, but of course you would immediately arrest a serial murderer and put him in jail. But you know, given that you can't, in the, in the case of, let's say, Soviet Union, you wouldn't go to war with the Soviet Union necessarily. You cannot have your own citizens helping the Soviet Union at the same time. Would you classify intellectual support in the same way that you do economic support for cases like that? <sighs> yeah, so if the intellectual support is specifically, you know, uh, uh, advocating the use of force against America, against your own country, then yes. So um, I think it was completely appropriate, for example, for, the con for Congress to investigate um, the Communist Party in the United States and, and, and to make it illegal when communism was a physical threat to the United States. And I think it is completely appropriate for the United States to monitor and, and in some cases in prison uh, uh, imams that are advocating for violence against the United States. You don't have a right of speech when that speech is to advocate murder. You don't have a right to advocate for murder. So, yes. And I mean, the line is when speech in effect becomes action. <clears throat> when you start calling for more murder, when you join the Communist Party, it's much more than advocating uh, a particular idea. You're, you're becoming part of an action against either specific individual in the, in the case of murder or against subverting your whole government in the case of joining the Communist Party or any other uh, group that's, whose goal is the overthrow of your government. Right? It's, it's, it's gone from speech to action and the government is to police action. <clears throat> and the threat of force is itself force. Thank you. Okay, thank you.